and you're listening to the Jungle Room podcast. There's a pretty little thing waiting for the king down in the Jungle Room. Welcome to the Jungle Room. I am Jamie Kay, and I'm excited for our next guest, Julian Grant. You are so far away from me right now, and you're actually in the future because you're like a day ahead of me. I'm back to the future right now. Yeah, it's, it's bizarre because we have an 18 hour time difference, right? Right. So it's 10 o'clock in the morning here on Thursday and it's Wednesday night at 7 p.m. in Alaska. Yep. Normally I work with uh, UK time, you know, so it's like seven hours difference and even Memphis is like 12 hours difference. So, but 18 hours is just bizarre. Yes, it is. And I kept, we've tried this, what, three or four times to get right. together. And I was getting confused. Your Thursday, I was taking it as Thursday for me as well. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and it's no, it's not. So that is so crazy. Well, I'm glad that we finally got together because <laughs> I understand you have tons of Elvis Presley stories. Which is very bizarre for me because I'm sorry, you do not look like you could be old enough to have <laughs> met Elvis Presley. I never met Elvis, but the, I was thinking about this the last couple of weeks since uh, we spoke and I was just thinking, my goodness, how fortunate I have been uh, just to be an Elvis fan. Right. How, luck, how lucky I've been. The, the closest people, the closest friends in my life even today, are through Elvis. The, the most exciting experiences other than birth of my children or getting married has been because of Elvis. And it continues um, to this day. Uh, I'm 55 this year. So I was young when Elvis died. And my mother was so, so, uh, so sad when he died because she said, I'm really sorry I can't take you to the funeral you know, because we couldn't Aww. afford to go in. Yeah. And uh, it, was a, it was a devastating time. And we went to the States the first time in 1978. And I went to, uh, we did Elvis's house at Beverly Hills at Hillcrest and stuff like that. Um, but I've always been um, an active fan. I've never really been somebody, I'm a collector, yes, because I collect books and music and uh, little knickknacks and stuff. But I've always been very active. And uh, I used to run the, you call them president in the, in the US, but in the UK, we call them branch leader. And I was branch leader of the Edinburgh Elvis Presley fan club. It was the official Elvis Presley fan club of Great Britain and we were the Edinburgh branch. And we were called the Memphis Mafia. And I think they, they formed around 1973. And for 10 years, I was the, the branch leader. And that, opened a lot of doors for me, you know, especially when I went to, to Memphis and stuff um, and met a lot of like fantastic people and had a lot of fantastic uh, experiences. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. So you never met Elvis, but your parents were close to Elvis, correct? No, 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 no. Um, no, we were just, uh, my dad was a, was, was a, was a big fan, but we, we never met him. But um, what happened was we, from when I first went, went to Memphis in 1983, Graceland had only been open like a year. Right. So um, it was very different to what it is now. So I was able to spend quite a bit of quality time with people who were close to Elvis. Um, and that's really, really special because nowadays it's a kind of meet and greet. You can't really talk to anybody, right? Mm -hmm. you, you see like Priscilla and you, you just like say hello or she'll sign something yeah? but in these days back in the 80s um, you were able to spend a significant amount of time some of your uh, listeners might remember there was a place called I think it was called stage 45 and it was right opposite Graceland and is the old the old plaza and there was an Elvis impersonator there called Dennis Wise and he was very famous at the time because he uh, had the uh, I think maybe the only guy who ever had plastic surgery to try to look like Elvis. So one day I went, and this must have been 83, 1983, 1984, and there was a guy behind the bar, and he had a t-shirt on, and it said Richard TCB. 
And I'm looking at him and I'm like, wow, that's Richard Davis. So Richard Davis, who had been with Elvis all these years. And so every single day um, before the place opened, I would go in and sit with Richard Davis and became really friendly with him. And then he introduced me to other people. And at that time, Charlie Hodge, um, I'm there one night and Charlie Hodge is in the corner, just standing on his own. And actually, I always felt Charlie was a bit kind of lost. And um, he's wearing an Elvis in concert jacket. And we sat for hours and hours and we played these slot machines on the bar. And then through him, I met people like Bill Burke, who introduced me to, you know, some of Elvis's uh, early girlfriends or like Barbara Hearn. Mm -hmm. uh, and all these people have uh, kind of molded the Elvis in, in, in a sort of different lights from what you can just get from books and stuff. Right. So I'm very much like Ian. I know you spoke to Ian before. Yes. I'm, a, I'm a kind of fan the, the, the same sort of way. I was just too young. Uh, and my, my parents were, were in Scotland. Um, so we, we, we didn't meet him. So were you raised on Elvis? <laughs> that, was, that was a very long, that was a very no, long no, answer. It was great. You had me, I mean, I was hooked. I was like really into to what you were saying. So um, did you say you've always been an Elvis fan or was there something that happened when you got older? No, I've like always your been. Your mom was a big Elvis fan. It was, it was my dad. Um, and I don't, I was trying to think about this because I don't think there's one, there was one defining moment, but I seem to remember asking about a song and I must, must have only been about five. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think it might have actually been Teddy Bear and my dad said it was Elvis and I'm saying, no, it wasn't Elvis. He's saying it was. And we were walking down, I remember this uh, quite vividly. We were walking down a, uh, a place where my dad stays in Leith in Edinburgh. And he had a friend with him called Joffrey. And Joffrey said that he loved this song called There's Always Me. And I just started to get quite interested in this guy. And my dad said, I've got some, I've got some uh, records you can have. And uh, we went to my dad's friend's house. His name was Franco. My dad's Italian, by the way. So um, his name was Franco. And we went there and he opened this cupboard and it was this big stack of Elvis albums. So this is probably 1971 or something, 70, 71. Uh, so he gave me all these albums, all, all these original things that he had bought in the 1950s. And it went right up. It was quite, it was fairly current. I remember he, him having a copy of the NBC TV special and I'm thinking, wow, you really, you really are a fan. You collected all these years. So that was it. Um, like Ian was saying, Elvis was very relevant at that time in the UK. I don't think so much in the States. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, he was, do, he, was, he was touring, but it wasn't really a chart act. Mm -hmm. um, so Elvis is playing these, these uh, towns and that's another story, these two-bit towns he had to play, but um, the, he was very current in the UK. The Wonder of You had been number one in 1970, uh, just can't help believing. All these songs were hits. So he was, he was very current and I would be excited to go and buy the, the new album. And I remember, going to buy um, what was the new release at the time. Um, so anyway, I started from that. I wasn't really into the 50s music so much. I, I didn't really identify with it at the time. I appreciate it more now that I'm older. Uh, so I really loved it. I used to just lie in my bedroom, I remember, and I'd have posters on the wall. And uh, I, I would lie in the bedroom and think about, I wonder what he's doing. I wonder where he is. Oh. Uh, I, I want to ask you about your trip to Graceland in 1982. 83 it was. 1983. Yeah. And this was your first trip to Graceland, correct? Yeah, I think I was trying to think about that too, because the, the last time I was in Memphis was 2017. And from Cambodia, where I am, it's a long way. It's over 9,000 miles, right? right. So it, right. You know, and I, I laugh. I go, to, I go to Memphis and people said, I came all the way from Georgia. Yeah, and I'm, I came from the other side of the planet. <laughs> uh, I think only some places in Australia are further away, so I've got to go from here to South Korea, and then from South Korea, I've got to go to like Atlanta, and then I mean it's just like yeah. A no, I live in Alaska, so I mean right. obviously right. it's not as far as you, but 
it's still yeah. it's still a lot further than Georgia to Tennessee. Um, so my last trip was 2017. I'll get to that in a second. But um, I was thinking I'd maybe been about 40 times to Memphis. Okay. Uh, maybe not quite that many, but somewhere between 35 times because I used to go twice a year when I lived in the UK. So I would go for birthday and I'd go for August as well. And I have a very close friend of mine who, who's from Memphis and lives in Memphis. So I'd always stay with him and I would have a car to drive and I, I became very comfortable in the, in the city. Uh, so my first time, and I would recommend that even today, that, that was your question, right? About my first no. time. No, <clears throat> my uh, question was, no, sorry. it's okay. No, you're fine. My question was, talk to me about your first trip to Graceland in 1983 because you know as you have pointed out it has changed tremendously over the years and I've actually never visited Graceland before. I, I, I heard that on one of your things and on one of the Yeah shows. I know my co-host loves to talk about that so I really want to know what it was like because was you just went minded. there a year after it opened. So it still had a, you know, I feel like it still had his spirit could have been felt strongly back then because it was still so close. My goodness, Jamie, uh, you hit the nail on the head. It was mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing. So what happened was, and it's a funny story because uh, I went on an organized trip mm -hmm. uh, because I was still quite young, I don't remember how old I was, 18, 17, I, I don't know. But anyway, I went and it was an organized trip and we flew to St. Louis and we got picked up by this guy called uh, uh, Art, who is still my close friend to this day and who I stay with when I go to Memphis. And Art picked us up, he was a bus driver for like Trailways or some one bus company. So he drives us, drives us to Memphis and of course, I'm fascinated by this guy because he sounds like Elvis. Because <laughs> he's from Memphis, right? Right. And he's going, to oh, y'all, welcome, y'all, y'all, y'all. I'm like, wow, you're just like Elvis. Did you ever see Elvis? He said, oh, we saw Elvis all the time back in the day, going, driving on a motorcycle. We'd wave to him, he'd wave back to us. It was just like, he was, he was from Memphis, you know? And I'm like, oh, this is so cool, this is so cool. So we get into Memphis, and he's taking us to the hotel, which was on Brooks Road, uh, just off Elvis Presley Boulevard. And I said, where are you going? And he said, to the hotel. And I said, no, no, you've got to take me to the house. You've got to take me to Graceland now. No, I've got to, I'm strict orders. I've got to take you to the hotel. And I said, no, absolutely not. You've got to take me to the house. So this was nighttime. So we drove past the house. And my goodness, it blew my mind because it was all lit up. And I remember thinking the gates were so small, the wall was so small that you could clearly see the house. And it helped because we were on a bus. And he didn't stop and let us out. He just drove past. Yeah. Uh, and it blew my mind. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. When you, went, when you went to the house at that time, and it makes me so sad now because last time I went, 2017, was probably going to be my last Elvis week for a bunch of reasons, which you may want to get into or not. But... Um, it breaks my heart in a lot of ways, but it's an empty shell now for me. Mm. And uh, it's, just, it's just not the same. But Aunt Delta was living there. I was getting ready to ask you, did you get to see Aunt Delta? Yes, yes. Yeah, we'd see her walking the dog. And uh, she was quite feisty, was uh, Aunt Delta. Mm -hmm. uh, always kind of grumpy looking. But Vester was a bit like that too. Uh, but yes, and it was a home and you could, and you know, when you go to somebody's house, even your best friend, the house has a certain smell. Right, right. So Graceland had that and it had it every year I kept going back and nothing else smelled like Graceland. It was exactly the same and it was fantastic. Uh, but now I, when I go there, and I don't know if it's because I'm older as well, but I go there and I stand at the the front of the house or I'm walking up the driveway and I look at it and it just looks like a shell. It looks like a museum. Mm. Um, and of course they've taken everything out, all the, all the kind of personal stuff um, all the, and moved it across the street. So for me, it's, it, it's not the same. And um, 
but you better not get me started on EPE. No, I, I have thought about that a lot, actually, because, you know, in the 80s, there was Aunt Delta still living there. The house was still a home because you, you couldn't even go in the kitchen, correct, back then in the yeah. 80s? Right, you couldn't go in the kitchen, and uh, obviously uh, uh, Gladys's room um, was, was Aunt Delta's, right? So you could. Right. So how did they have the kitchen closed off? Did you could you see the kitchen? You just couldn't walk through it, or no, well, you it, still can't walk through it. But yeah, you, well, you you walk through from the dining room, and you just walk through it to the oh, okay. jungle room, and you go around. But I think the door was probably closed. The kitchen door was closed. Okay. So you would walk up to the the dining room, but you couldn't you couldn't turn. Uh, right and go into the kitchen like you can do now. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, so so much has changed as people have said. And uh, and there was more things. There's more buildings and everything um, around it. So was the plane still? Where was the plane in the eighties? The Lisa Marie. I don't think the plane was there the first time I went. I think the plane came back in eighty four. Okay. Um, and it's always been in the same the, the same spot. They had uh, they had the offices. Uh, tour bus, the, the the bus that you used to drive between uh, LA and, right. and Memphis, mm -hmm. that was that was on display, and I don't know what happened to that, but I, I think I think it might have been eighty four that the plane came back. I could be totally wrong, but I don't remember the plane on my first trip. Okay, uh, but it, it might it might have been there. But I don't remember that, but uh, yeah. So obviously they built this big complex across the street, and. Uh, I don't like it. Um, I understand some people do. I think uh, it's just like going to Walmart or something. It's just this very cold, empty space. Yeah. Um, you know, I've got a lot, of, a lot of problems with EPE, <clears throat> but at the same time, they're capable of doing some fantastic things. Uh, there, have, there have been things like the Elvis concert. The, the, the first one, I went to the first one. And I've seen it everywhere. I saw it in Bangkok, Thailand, and I've been to all the big ones. And I've seen it in Wembley, and I've seen it um, in, in various countries. And I've seen all the big ones in Memphis. And the first one was, was fantastic, and uh, it was 1997. And it was really cool. They had this, uh, with the, with, at the start of the concert, this is the mid -South Coliseum. So it was very exciting because Elvis had played there. They played there 74, 75, 76. And, uh, so it was very cool, and we're there, and uh, we're all sitting, and this black Cadillac comes in with all the smoke around it, and you've got like Joe Espadillo and Jerry Schilling and maybe George Klein and a couple of people all with their hands on the on the hood and on the uh, on the roof, and this coming in really slowly as 2001 is playing, mm -hmm. and it was just so cool. And I thought, who thought about that? These days, when you have people like Todd Morgan and all these guys working at house, uh, working at, uh, at Graceland, these guys were fans, and they would bounce ideas off each other. Going back to, just thought me of a bounce around, Jamie. No, you're but, good. Go on. Uh, when you were talking to Ian, uh, Ian and I uh, really used to bounce off each other, and we we ran the fan club together. Essentially, we used to have a kind of, we used to put on conventions. We would take a whole hotel and we'd have seven function suites and they would run simultaneously for 12 hours. We did this once a year and about 600 people used to come. It was a big event in Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, we did this every year. We had bowling nights, we had picnics, and every month we had an Elvis dance. Uh, we were very, very active. So when we, made, when we go to Memphis, we, we were also very, very active. And I was thinking about one thing I did with Mike Freeman, who's from Memphis. We, we broke into the house at Laurel Courts. Um, everything was kind of abandoned. And it was really scary. And we're walking down and we get to the, the door. And I, I gently push the door. And there's nobody around. There's a couple of winos like sitting downstairs, you know, yeah. drinking out of like uh, brown bags. Uh, and I said, push the door open, push the door open. Let's go in. And we give it a push and the door opens and we walk in and we're walking around the apartment. And what was cool about it was a bit of the floorboards had popped up, the original floorboards. So we ripped a piece off each and I took it home. So this is, this is a bit of floor. This is from the original. Uh, oh my goodness. Oh my is, gosh, look at that. So 
th- the listeners who are just hearing this on the podcast and not the YouTube channel, can you explain what you're holding? Well, it's, I don't know how big that is, Jamie, but it's a, it's a square piece of wood. So they, they obviously were all clipped together, the wooden floor at the house in Lauderdale Court, Gladys Vernon and Elvis. Yeah. And it was really funny. You see, it's got like old tar or something at the back. Yes. Oh my gosh. And when I, when I came through customs in Scotland and the guy asked me what this was, I said, it's a piece of Elvis's floor. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, what are you talking about? I said, oh, I ripped it up from Elvis's house. Uh, and he's smelling the, the black tar and stuff. But anyway, I put a little black on it to say it was from, uh, um, but that was like one cool thing that we did. Um, that is so cool. I am so jealous of you right now. And then uh, I did the same thing at the, at the Karate Institute. Um, they're taking off the floorboard, or the floors where Elvis had, uh, done karate and all the tiles were just thrown in this room so mm-hmm. I took one of these as well and I got Wayne Carmen who practiced with him to sign it and Al Holcomb wow. signed it as well wow. uh, to Julian so that was a piece of floor tile When it comes to embroidery, screen print, vinyl, trophies, baby and ladies apparel there's only one place to go that sassy girl apparel You can call them at 662-280-8020. Find them on Facebook at Sassy Girl Apparel. Email them at sgastore at yahoo.com. When it comes to embroidery, screen print, vinyl, trophies, baby and ladies apparel, nobody beats Sassy Girl Apparel. Um, but uh, I don't know what we're talking about, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I remember Ian didn't mention it, but we broke into Union Station, uh, the railway station that Elvis used to, to uh, use. We, we climbed in somewhere and we went inside this old abandoned building and there was boxes of like papers and stuff. Um, and that, that's the sort of thing we do. And that's why I really enjoy Billy Stallings' channel, The Spy Guy. Oh, you know? Yes, The Spy Guy, yes. Because we do this, we, that's the sort of thing that we do. I remember, I don't know if it was you or Ashley Drew was, was talking about uh, inside Graceland, the racquetball court. And when I you think it was Ashley stairs, Drew. Right, when you walk down the stairs, she said it's a bathroom. And one year I opened it, the door was open. Ooh. And I just opened it and I went inside and it is a bathroom. It absolutely is a bathroom. But uh, you've got to take these chances when you can. Yes. Oh, most definitely. I have it. I have an agenda when I visit Graceland for the first time. <laughs> you know, I have a plan. So, so you mentioned. Oh, yeah. Oh, go sorry, ahead. sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Your turn. Oh, you mentioned Uncle Vester, and I want to know what you, if you actually got to meet him and what that experience was like. A few times. I mean, he wasn't the most talkative guy in the world. Um, I met him a few times. He, he was just. He actually, I remember one time I was, because uh, we used to call him Uncle Vesta. You didn't right. call him Vesta, you just called him Uncle Vesta. Mm-hmm. And I, I saw him, he was driving out of Graceland and he was in a pickup truck and he had the window down. And uh, I said, Uncle Vesta, how are you? And he, and he spat out the window. I'm all right, how are you doing today? That's, that's the sort of guy I was, right? It was yeah. like the Beverly Hillbillies. Uh, but but he didn't he didn't have a lot to say. Uh, he uh, I'll tell you a couple of good good guys good people that I met. Uh, Sonny West. Uh, I love Sonny. Yes. Um, he was Richard Richard Davis was very very nice to me very very kind to me. Uh, Sonny also and Marty Lacker. And in fact this this is a this is Elvis's tie that Marty gave me. I got from Marty. So it's a tie, Elvis's tie. And then Marty wrote me a nice letter explaining how he and Richard Davis were sitting in Elvis's bedroom. Can you hold that up to the camera? Just let's see. Yeah, this is this is from Marty to me. Uh, he said I've now sold it to Julian Grant in Cambodia. Mm-hmm. It's an Adams uh, Adams Row tie. 
And he's, he tells, he, he told me the story verbally as well, that they're sitting on the floor in the bedroom at Graceland, him and Richard. And Elvis is pacing around and he's going to the closet and he's just throwing things out and he's saying, just kind of take what you want. And that's something Elvis would do. Uh, it's, it's quite well known that he'd give clothes away and stuff. And uh, he, he picked up that tie and kept it. So uh, I, I have that here now. And it's nice because it's very old. And, uh, yeah. So you got to know Sonny West and Marty Lacker yeah. pretty well. And so tell me, we'll get to Marty Lacker in a second, but I want to know what your experiences were with Sonny West. So the first couple of times I met him, it was just, uh, of course, I'd read his books and everything, and I knew, I knew very well. And I think all these Elvis people were always really quite amazed about how much I knew about them <laughs> right, yeah. as, as, as well as Elvis. But I met him just uh, uh, the first couple of times. It was just like a, a normal kind of meet and greet where you just shake hands and say, hi, how are you doing? Nice to see you. And then one day, uh, the second last time I saw him was at the Peabody Hotel in Memphis. And I don't know why I was there. I, I must have been there for something. But um, he was walking around the foyer. And I went, hi, Sonny, blah, blah, blah. I'm Julian. Uh, we met there, we met there, we met. and he was like, yeah, yeah, I remember, and you're Alan, right? And that was my friend Alan. And we we're like, wow. And he said, come on, let's just walk over here. Now, a lot of people wouldn't do that. A lot of people would just say, yeah, yeah, and then just walk away and say, excuse me, nice to meet you, and politely leave. But we went away, and we sat in a corner, and we, we sat for a couple of hours, and we, just, we were eating peanuts, and we're just talking, and we're talking about... Funny enough, what you were talking about the other day, would you have gone back uh, after being fired? You know, uh, mm -hmm. I understand the reasons you wrote the book and do you think you would have gone back? Why did Elvis never go to the UK? Mm -hmm. um, asked him all these sort of questions. And it was really nice because he was in no hurry. And he sat back and we had a little bowl of peanuts mm -hmm. and he just, he spent a lot of time. Uh, and I really, I'll never forget that. And I said to him, you're right, you're really honest, eh? You're really honest and you're really open. And he said to me, that's what Elvis said was my worst fault. And I said, I, I, I mean, I get it. And then I met him another time. When, when he signed his book for me at the end, he just, he said something like to Julian, a very special young man or something. It was very nice. But uh, I thought he was great. Um, and you know, when, Unless you're in that situation where you're actually sitting one-on-one -on -one with somebody, you can't really have the conversations that you want to have, right? Right, yes. Um, and he, he, I remember him, I always kind of had the feeling that Elvis didn't want to go to the UK because I figured that if he wanted to go, he would have done it, right? You know, um, Julian, that is something that I, from my research, because I always believe that the Colonel held him back. And the more I had an interview with Charles Stone, who was really good friends with the Colonel, and I've done, right. have had a lot of conversations with John Daly, and and then I actually has spoken with Elena Nash, who is the writer of the book The Memphis Mafia, essential book, right? So there's there's different opinions on whether or not the colonel prevented Elvis from going to UK, but this is something that John said to me in our discussion, which really hit home. Elvis Presley did what Elvis Presley wanted. Right. I do think that there was some truth to the fact that the colonel did not want Elvis flying uh, to another country because of the drugs. I think that was part of it. And there may be some truth to the fact that the colonel had couldn't travel overseas i mean charles stone says that's not it that it was the drugs everyone else you know and a lot of the individuals in neville's circle blame colonel tom parker so i, I can see that there's probably truth in everything but if the so colonel well, was getting paid that much money and he you know, vowed to protect Elvis, and that was the star, that was what was bringing in the income, and he decided to, to take the fall and be the bad guy, let everyone hate Colonel Tom Parker and not hate Elvis, that was a pretty smart business decision for him to make, because mm -hmm. look at us now, 
almost 43 years to his death, he's still, he's bigger than ever. Yeah. I mean, Charlie Horst still said to me, oh, he didn't want to go. Right. And then, and then he kind of, when I looked a bit shocked, I think he, he, then he laughed. So I was never sure whether he meant it or not. Sonny said to me that, you know, the colonel could have got a passport. Yeah. Some way, somehow. He was a wheeler dealer. He knew presidents. He knew. He knew that, that's what John Daly pointed out. The, the been Colonel Tom Parker had connections. Yeah. So it kind of makes you, I bet Elvis didn't want to go, but I think it wasn't that Elvis didn't want to go because he didn't want to be around his fans in other countries. Because we know how Elvis felt. I think there's some truth to the drugs. Well, I mean, that, that was Sonny. Sonny said that to me when I asked him the question. He said two things, the guns and the drugs. Well, you, can't, you can't land, whether you've got a, a private plane or not, you can't land in London Heathrow Airport and come off the plane with all these bags of drugs and guns. I mean, you just can't do it. Right. Uh, but also at that time, I mean, and Joe Esposito always maintained that Elvis bought the plane specifically and uh, to... Oh, I'll show you this because this is very cool. This is my Lisa Marie. Oh, wow. I love that. <laughs> this is the sort of little thing I like to get, you know. Yeah. My dad, I love Lisa Marie. But anyway, Joe said that Elvis bought that plane specifically uh, big enough to, to do a, a transatlantic and flight. Right? You, and you know, John Daly had brought up this point when I had him on the show. Mm -hmm. he, he was like, how many people do you know that have, you know, a plane like that? They, they have their own planes, but they don't have a big, huge commercial size airplane. Right. Elvis Presley did. But even if he owned his own plane, I mean, he would still have to go through customs, correct? Yeah. yeah. My personal feeling on it, my personal feeling on it is that when Elvis was invited many, many times in the 1960s, in fact, the Queen of England invited him. Uh, I could understand all the business moves from the Colonel that it wasn't going to happen, that maybe there wasn't somewhere suitable for him to play. Uh, he was contracted to the movies. Colonel's philosophy of keeping Elvis at a distance actually really worked. Uh, so I get all that. In the 1970s, maybe Elvis thought he would like to do it. I'm, I'm sure he, he wanted to go. He said it himself. He wanted to go to Japan. He wanted to go to Europe. He wanted to go to the UK. But by the time he bought the plane in 1975, there was no state to do it. It right. was too late. Yeah. Uh, I, and I have to, I, I think I agree with you on that. I think that fundamentally is the, the ultimate thing. I think had Elvis been as Elvis was in 1969 and 1975 when he got the plane, they would have made it work. They could have found a way. Um, but I think that uh, it was in no it was in no state to do it, unfortunately. Did you talk to Marty Lacker about the, these types of things? What was Marty Lacker's opinion? Marty, Marty just blamed the colonel totally. Mm -hmm. on, um, he he said it was it was the colonel holding him back. Mm -hmm. um, Marty, I loved Marty because I started talking to him. And somebody else mentioned it the other day, actually, on one of your podcasts. There was a there was a group called Alt Elvis King, and it was long before we had Facebook and anything mm -hmm. like that. It was just kind of news group, and Marty was always on it. Right. So we spoke spoke for years until I finally until we actually met up in person, and it was like two old lost friends. But we used to communicate, and in fact, just before he died, we had, we had been talking, and he had told me that he had bent down or trying to get something out of the washing machine and slipped and fell. And I think I said some crude remark to him and he said something crude to me as well because we used to kind of speak like that. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, I would hear from him and I would say, oh, oh, Marty, you're not dead yet. And, you know, we'd just be like terrible with each other. Uh, but, so I was completely shocked when he died. Completely shocked. But he was always, he was a straight shooter, right, Marty? Yeah. And he was very opinionated. Mm -hmm. He was very... Uh, um, he didn't doubt, I mean, I think it's like you said, Jamie, I mean, he didn't doubt Elvis loved his fans and wanted to travel and, and perform. Um, but he did, he did blame, he did think it, it lay with the Colonel, um, about not touring. Well, overseas. you know, that went back to what John Daly's opinion was that, that he heard. And, and I think Charles Stone even said this too, you know, 
Colonel would rather be the one hate it than anyone hate Elvis. Put the blame on Colonel Tom Parker, not put the blame on Elvis. And we see this in the Elvis world. We, I mean, we see it in just the world we live in today. People want, when they believe a narrative, whether or not it's, it's true, whether or not facts are, are shown to them, if there's a narrative that they feel strongly about, they're not going to speak be swayed people are going to believe what they want to believe i always wondered if they i think the guys had said that they always noticed there was a kind of strange accent but they didn't know he was dutch mm -hmm. uh, and not an american citizen and i've never been able to get a straight answer on whether elvis knew or not but wasn't uh, colonel tom parker in the american wasn't he in the military uh, the u.s yes, military? yes so how yeah. could he have not been legit I mean, you know, right? I don't think you can just join the U.S. military and not be a citizen. I'm pretty sure like you can't do that. He conned his way into it, and he went AWOL, did he not? You know, that's. I think that's just, again, speculation and rumors. I don't know if that's a fact. Mm. But I think I'll have to check in on that. You that. should, yeah. yeah. Um, so Marty Lacker, Sonny West, <laughs> did you yeah, ever get to meet his cousin Red? That was my, that's my, my biggest regret that I didn't meet Red. Mm. That is, uh, Red is just like so important. Mm. Uh, such a, a huge part of the puzzle. Yes. And, you know, Red would say, I could read Elvis Presley like a book. And um, absolutely don't doubt it. Um, I want than, to do more research on Red West. I'm going, I'm, I'm working on actually an episode just on Red West because I find him to be fascinating. He did go on to be very accomplished after the whole thing in 1976 when he was fired. You, you know, he, he, he lived a very good life and he held his own. What I do want to ask you about, because we've talked about some of the guys, you know I'm going to ask you about this. Tell me about some of Elvis's women that you've met, if you've met any. <laughs> I've just kind of met the, the, the early girlfriends, you know, Dixie Locke. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you who was very, very sweet uh, was Anita Wood. Uh, oh, you got to meet Anita Wood? Oh, my so goodness. What, well, she, she, she invited me for dinner. Oh, well, uh, check you out, Mr. Right. Julian Grant. There was, there was a few of us, uh, I think two of us or something, and we, we were just wandering around. It was one Elvis week, and we went to this hotel, and Anita was talking. Uh, it was on, again, it was on uh, Brooks Road, I think. And I went up and I spoke to her and I said, I've just been to your house. And she said, what? I said, I just went to your house where Elvis picked you up. It's near the Memphian Theatre in Midtown. I had the address and I went to check it out, you know. And she was like amazed. And then we started talking and I was talking about how many times I've been to Memphis and all the things that I'd done and blah, blah, blah. And she said, what are you doing now? Do you want to come for dinner? Oh, my and goodness. And I said, yeah. <laughs> so they said, follow me. She was with her husband uh, and some other people. Uh, I'm sure it was all family members and maybe a couple of friends. And they said, just follow us. So I just followed them in the car. And, and it, it seemed quite a long way. Uh, it might have been like over to Mississippi or something. So we just went for dinner and just sat and talked about Elvis and talked about, you know, my life, her life. And she was just, she was super sweet. Um, and that was, uh, that was a really nice, nice thing to do. Barbara Hearn, uh, Barbara Smith, as she is now, Barbara and I first spoke on uh, email. Okay. Um, uh, and she had mentioned she had a Scottish connection and stuff. And then I met her and, and I said, hi, I'm Julian. Hi, Julian, you know, and like, like she had known me for years. Yeah. And then uh, Ian met her. And he said, I am in from Scotland. And she said, hi, do you know Julian? And then the next year I would see her again and see her again and see her again. So, and then I took some really nice, some of my favorite photographs I've taken are, are pictures I took uh, at, of uh, Barbara at Audubon Drive. We went out on this kind of, on a, on a coach tour and Barbara was there. Uh, Barbara was part of it. And I took all these photographs of her standing at the, at the gate, at the mailbox, at the, at the tree inside. And uh, she's a she's a real sweetheart. She's a lovely, lovely oh my woman. Goodness. 
Um, I love her and Anita was great. Um, I want to go back. I want to stop you really quickly because I want to go back to Anita. Were there any specific stories that you have held on to that she told you that night? They're all, all the, the stuff you've heard before, uh, but just how it, he knew that uh, Elvis had Priscilla and stuff, you know. Oh, yeah. And then she marched her little self out of the house. Yes. And, uh, yes. and you know, Elvis couldn't take the confrontation, um, which is, that's very Elvis, right? Right, yeah. Avoid confrontation. You know, it's so amazing if when you look at that stretch of life for Elvis with the women, there he was battling Anita and Priscilla, who's going to, who's going to win. Then it was Priscilla and Anne Margaret. Right, right. Then, and then it was Linda Thompson and Ginger Alton. It, yeah. it, it's funny how he always had one waiting. Well, I think, I, I think Ginger was, uh, Ginger's, uh, she's different because Linda had already left. Well, no, uh, Linda, he had sent the plane. He had told Linda, she wrote about this in her, in her book. And, and then Ginger also confirmed she, so Ginger was like in, in one room, one floor down of the hotel. Yeah, so, and, right, and, right, and, so right, and Anita, right. the reason why Anita laughed because she overheard Elvis telling yeah. Vernon who, I don't know who I want here for Christmas. Yeah. And then he had wanted Anne Margaret to come to Graceland. And she said, I will not go to Graceland when that woman lives there. Yeah. So it's like he, <laughs> that's what I meant. There was, it was, there was always one in wait. Always. Right, I was worried. But you're absolutely right. I remember now because Elvis, uh, Linda left Elvis in, in San Francisco, at the Cow Palace, so 1976. And you're right. And Elvis must have known. And uh, Ginger was upstairs. That's right, because it was about the yeah. time. Because he uh, told Linda, I, yeah. "I sent the plane for you," and she's yeah, like, "Really? Yeah. You sent the plane just for me?" What had happened yeah. was he had flown Ginger in, right. and right. then yeah, doing just it's kind of a revolving door. I always wondered also how Elvis was able to drop people from his life. You know, like, how come you don't see Scotty Moore again after 68? You know, I, I think Elvis was someone who did not like that type of confrontation. I mean, we do know he, he, he was confrontational in his temperament, especially when there were right. drugs involved. I don't think, I think some things were just really painful for him. And I think he, like a lot of people, myself included, you just kind of, you compartmentalize it. You, you kind of lock things in a box and if you don't have to see it, then you don't have to face it. Right, I mean, I mean it's a dichotomy, right? Because he's not, he's really a complicated, because he's, he's no dummy, Elvis was no dummy. No. He was very, very intelligent, man. Uh, and then, you know, I remember Marty saying, and I think he might have wrote it as well, he said, you know, I always wondered actually, if Elvis really liked us at all. Mm. At one point, and I, I thought think I read that really, too. What a bizarre thing to say, you know. And because they always could be really cruel, eh? Yeah, uh, he could be very cruel. It's almost like he he tried his his best to push people away just to see who would stay. You know, it, it was. I, I my heart goes out to those guys because I know a lot of people blame them for Elvis's demise. They. But and they say that well they didn't need to if they didn't want to be there they they didn't have to, but when you are friends with someone that you strongly care about and in Billy Smith's case it, it, that was family that was blood, you just you invest so much time and emotion and you guys go through all the stuff together. I can see where you just can't just cut that out because it's not just your your boss it's your friend it's your brother. I mean, I, I think it's, it's the way that uh, Billy and Joe were treated by yeah, it has been disgusting. Eh? Well, and, actually, yeah. and it's I very actually, sad, the Smith family, because, you know, I, I don't put any blame on Lisa Maria, because, you know, look, Priscilla's her mother. That's been her, the parent that's raised her. You know, a child's not going to go against their mother in that way. If the mother says whatever they say, you know, maybe eventually she will search out on her own. But I, you know, I have a mom, and if my mom said, I'm going to believe what my mom says. I just think I, I think you know, the way they were treated, and you know, Billy ended up. Yeah, it's not right. And you, you know, hopefully, right. 
you know, I always believe the truth always comes out no matter when and, and, and where it'll come out. I said that to Joe Smith, uh, I was talking to, uh, because, and, and Billy as well, and they were totally fine about it. Mm -hmm. I remember saying to Joe, because Joe Smith is very underrated as well. She's got, she, uh, yeah. she knows a lot of stuff. She's very important. She does. And she, you know what, if there's a lot of attention that goes to Elvis's women and, you know, being in Elvis world, but Joe Smith was, I mean, those, she was gorgeous. I mean, she's still a beautiful lady, but. In the seventies, I've seen some pictures of her. She could, she could totally have been like a Hollywood actress. Oh, well, Billy was uh, out of his league on that one. There's no. I question. know. I keep, I'm still trying to figure that one out. <laughs> and she, she, she's lovely, and uh, I've met her and, and spoke with her briefly, and um, and I actually, I said to her, and I stopped the conversation, and I wish I hadn't said it, but I said to her, you know what? I'm, I'm really sad that Elvis was sad. Mm. And uh, she almost kind of teared up and she just excused herself and left. And I thought, I wish I hadn't said that because she's a fascinating person to speak to. Mm. Um, but going back to, um, I mean, I don't know how things are going to, what, what's going to happen going forward with regards to what's happening at Graceland and everything, you know. Mm. Um, you know, can I talk a bit about that? Yeah, go. Yes. Um, it was funny about the, because I saw the, the you've, you've seen the thing that Billy Stallings put up about the, the bicycle. Yes, and yes. We all tried for years. We all knew it was a bike. Hmm. Not just me, other people as well. But Graceland didn't want to listen to anybody. They, they would never accept the fact that maybe, you know, Elvis fans might actually know a little bit more. Um, we, we, we just had a feeling it was. I remember we went to the corporate office and we said, listen, that bike in the smokehouse, that's the bike that Elvis brought from, uh, from Tupelo. Mm -hmm. We're absolutely sure. Look at the age of it, look at the condition of it. What else is it going to be? And they weren't interested. And then I remember going one time and they had the, you know, the sundial jumpsuit, the last Elvis, the last right. suit they wore. Right. They, had, they had some signage at the time and they said like made in 1977. And I said, actually, the suit's from 74, eh? That was for in Lake Tahoe in October. Absolutely not. Refused to acknowledge the fact, but it is the fact. And now, now they just say the sundial suit. But there's been numerous things over the years where we've gone to, to try and, as fans, just say, listen, this is wrong. Your picture advertising the trip to Hawaii is a picture from Panal Kofoko. So you should change it. They don't want to hear it. And uh, I'm sorry, there's certain things, like in the new exhibition, when you go inside and you turn left, they've got other versus gold records. And they're just kind of thrown up on the wall. And in amongst them somewhere is Heartbreak Hotel, the first one. And you see the pictures of Elvis holding it when he gets it in Nashville in 1956. And he's beaming, he's so happy. And what a moment that must have been for him. Mm -hmm. He was so proud. And then you've got a picture of Gladys looking up at it in, in the Audubon Drive house and everything. It's such a big deal, this first gold record, right? It's just thrown up on the wall and said it's nothing. The gold lamy suits just, there's just like a lack of care, eh? Mm -hmm. And it drives me insane. But then at the same time, I go around the corner and there's quite a good exhibition about the army. And it's like, and then I, I, I speak to somebody like Angie Marchese and I'll say, Angie, you need to do something about the trophy room. You've had these movie posters up for 15 years. It's boring, eh? You, you can do so much more. Doesn't want to hear it, eh? Doesn't want to hear anything you've got to say. And then at the same time, they always dumb down Elvis fans. Whenever I see anything from them and when I hear them speaking, we're always getting dumbed down. Well, do and you think sorry. that they're trying to dumb down or do you think they're speaking to the younger generation that's coming in that's just now well, learning about Elvis? No, I think they've always been like that. Mm. maybe they think we're all geriatrics or something <laughs> uh, but and I don't appreciate it you know I travel from around the world from the other side of the world to go there spend money and you know uh, I'm, I'm a fan and they're they're very adamant Elvis belongs to them no he doesn't he belongs to all of us Elvis belongs to us all he doesn't belong to you 
You know, you can you can market the name, whatever, but it always belongs to us because without us, you're nothing. And when in 2017, when they started to charge for the candlelight, they really screwed up big time. And oh. um, what a did what they, a disaster. Didn't they go back to it being yeah. free, or, yeah. did they, or do they still charge? No, they, they went back. They had to. Oh. They realized what, what a mistake okay. they, they've made. Okay. But they've destroyed any sort of uh, atmosphere that used to be there. And what, uh, one other thing I'll tell you in a second, but um, they, now they've got the hotel next door, the guest house at Graceland. And you're supposed to just kind of go there and hang about the foyer and meet people. You don't want to hang around a hotel foyer, right? I mean, who, who, why would you want to do that? When you have that complex across the street, everybody would be walking around, there'd be live music, there'd be people playing and singing. You'd run into people, they had all the shops open. It was a great atmosphere. You would go and meet people. What I was so excited about the last time I went in 2017 was to run into my own friends. Didn't see anybody. I saw like one or two people that, where is everybody? You know, and I would go to an event because now one thing we're calling it now is kind of Elvis Tribute uh, Artist Week, right? That's what it's turned into. Mm -hmm. It's not about, you know, Elvis anymore. It's about, you know, the tribute artists. And I would go to these events where you'd have like Gary Lockwood who was in like It Happens at World's Fair or you'd have Elvis Co-Star. So you'd have people who worked in the studio. And these are interesting things to do. And uh, Tom Brown is, is fantastic in, at his job of interviewing all these people. And you go there and the auditorium's like half full. And I'm like, where is everybody? You know, where's the atmosphere? Where, where are the people? And then as soon as they're doing the ultimate tribute contest, the queue to get in is right around the street, way down and way down the block. It's sold out like two months in advance. And I'm like, what's going on? And it's just like bizarre to me, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, so it's completely, and I know people are going to argue with me and think that the complex is fantastic, but I think it's cold. I think it's uninviting. I think it's unimaginative, I think, uh, and I don't want to see, I don't want to go to a little corner called Icons with all these American stars that nobody's heard of outside of Nashville. Mm -hmm. They don't mean anything to me. And now they had like a dinosaur exhibition and stuff like that. Well, what's all that about? So know. it drives me crazy, Jimmy. No, I get it. I get it. Well, you know, I think that also makes us appreciate what John Daly is doing with the summer festival. They're, they're great. I've been to a couple of them. Uh, I only met John briefly. Uh, I think somebody introduced. I think because I, I I'd known Dick Grove before, uh, so I think Dick Grove had gone uh, every year, and I think I met John through through him. But um, no, they're great, and there's always been that sort of thing in Memphis, though. But John's has become uh, has developed more and more over the years, and he's got people like Billy and Joe to go, which is, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Which is great because oh. there is a more of an intimacy with John Daly's event. It sounds like versus the EPE events. And he gives away donuts. You get free donuts and coffee and stuff like that. So it's always good. <laughs> Before I let you go, I want to ask you, what is your all-time favorite memory of your adventure in the Elvis Presley world? There's so many. I was very fortunate that I was at the there's lots of things that stick in my mind. But one thing that was very cool, and I won't say this is my favorite because there's been lots, but I was at the, I was at the event in 1992 at the racquetball court where they did the unveiling of the gold records for the first time. Mm. Uh, that was a really, really, really special moment. Eh? Um, I really felt it was there. Eh? It, was, it was incredible. So we're in the racquetball court and uh, they're playing 2001 and it's all dark and there's like a light going around and then this, all, the, all the curtains drop and all these gold records and everybody using flash and their camera and it's all bouncing around. That was a really fantastic experience. The first Elvis in concert thing in 1997 was fantastic. My first trip to Memphis was fantastic. Um, lots of crazy things that we've done. We, there's, there's fans like uh, Mary Clark online, Maria Mendez, uh, these guys, uh, we, we recreate photographs. So we go to like a, a spot Elvis stood and we, we stand in the same position and take our picture and match it up. Yeah. Oh, Ashley Drew does that as well. Yeah. So we, we, do, we do that all the time. Anytime, anytime 
and wherever we are in America, we've got to find out where Elvis was, right? So, because right. he'd been everywhere. Uh, and I learned so much about, I know all the like capitals of, uh, and all the states of America, I learned it all through Elvis, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But there isn't, there isn't one specific thing, Jamie. Um, there's, oh, I will tell you one amazing story. Okay, go ahead. This is the late 80s, maybe 1988. 1989, the Jordanaires are uh, backing up this guy. His name is Johnny Dumper. I think he changed his name to Johnny Errol. And he was kind of what we would call an Elvis impersonator. And as I was the branch leader of the, uh, the Elvis fan club, they were, they were doing this big concert in Edinburgh at a place called the Usher Hall, which is a theater, really nice theater. And they said to me, would you like to introduce with John Mears on stage. And I said, uh, well, that would be fantastic. Would you like to be the host? And, blah, blah, blah. and I'm saying, yeah, fantastic. So I go there and I go backstage and we chit chat with the John Mears and then uh, I introduce them on stage. They do their stuff, they have a break. And we kind of, at the end of the concert, we're sitting talking. And I say to Gordon Stoker, I say, Gordon, it's so, I can't tell you how fantastic it is to me. You know, I'm going to go home and I'm going to watch the Ed Sullivan show. I'm going to just watch you guys. Uh, I know that you have to leave the day after tomorrow. I know you're going somewhere. How do you feel about me coming to the hotel tomorrow and picking you up and showing you Edinburgh? And he said, that would be fantastic. So I'm like really excited. And I said, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll be there eight o'clock. I'll pick you up, Ray Walker, yourself. Uh, Neil Matthews and uh, Dwayne West, I think the guy's, the guy's name was at the time. And uh, he said, yeah, great. So I drive home and I'm thinking, this isn't going to happen, right? I mean, I'm going to turn up at the hotel tomorrow and they're not going to be there. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm just another crazy fan. So I get to the hotel and I'm like 15 minutes early because I'm so excited. And they're already at the foyer, the four of them. And I'm like, oh, Okay, let's go. So I think Ray Walker sits in the front seat with me and Neil Matthews and Gordon Stoker and Dwayne West are in the back. So I drive them, I drive them to Edinburgh Castle. We get out, they're like, wow, Edinburgh Castle. And uh, so we're like looking around, I take them to the park, I take them down Princess Street, which is like at our main street. So this, here's me with the Jordanaires in the car. So I think what I've got to do is I've got to sing, right? Now, I'm not a singer. <laughs> so I just said, treat me like a fool. And then, do, 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 do. They start singing in the car. <laughs> so here I am driving this old Toyota, this Toyota Corolla or something it was, driving down the street in Edinburgh, singing in the car with the Jordanaires. That was a pretty cool thing to do. That is really, really cool. That is awesome. And we got a really nice picture backstage. Of, of the of us together and uh neil matthew said no no i need to stand here gordon needs to stand here because this is how we would do it with Elvis, and i've still got it here it's really nice oh my god uh, that, that's great and little other kind of knickknacks i've got but this is funny remember ian told you about the light bulb you stole from the house and rocker place yes here it is oh there it is it's still got dust on it i never cleaned it <laughs> that Wow. Hold it back and up again. Hold it back up again. The picture's all faded now. But that uh, is cool. I, when he, that's the sort of thing we do. I've got my summer festival hat. I was going to wear it today, as you see, like, and that's the way it is. Yeah, there it is. And what's cool about this is it's been signed. Now, I don't know if you can see that. Oh, I can see it. Oh, that's, oh wow. But, but the, the Y is kind of faded now. The Y goes right around. Yeah. Now, I've never been completely sure. I spoke to uh, John Heath, who's a big collector, and he reckons it's, it's legitimate. Um, but, you know, to sign your name on this is really difficult. Yeah. Because it's a, a straw hat. But it's got Elvis Presley on it. And I'll show you one last thing, because this is very cool, too. I have to, you have to have a scarf, right? So I've got my Elvis Shut scarf Shut up. And... Uh, Unfortunately, this is a ticket from the show, so uh -huh. this is from uh, uh, February 1977. These pictures, unfortunately, have completely faded down, 
so I need to rescan them and, and, and put them in. But it's very cool to have a yeah, and you have the scarf. Yeah, nice. Wow. And a few other bits and pieces like G D uh DJ Fontana signed the drumstick for me. I like I really liked him as well. Um mm -hmm. I met him a few times and he was so kind of I'm just a drummer, you know. He was like What's what's the opposite of being? It was so um, modest. Humble. Humble. It was so yeah. humble. It was so humble. But yeah. anyway, I've, you're you're now starting to get me think about stories. But I've forgotten about that one about the Jordanaires. That was very cool. And you're listening to the Jungle Room podcast. There's a pretty little thing waiting for the king down in the jungle room.